Okay, thanks everyone for coming. We appreciate it. Um, we, I, of course, I guess you're here, Jake and I assume you're here, to learn a little bit about pain. Um, so we thought the best idea to really have a good learning experience here today is that we all experience pain at the same time. So before you arrive, Jake and I actually wired all your seats. Um, so on the count of three, I'm going to hit this button. We're all going to experience pain. Ready? One, two. Just kidding, obviously. So that was Jake's idea. Okay. I said that was bad. Just kidding. The ethics board uh, just did, wouldn't approve it. No, it was totally their, their fault. Um, but anyways, back to why we're here tonight, to um, understanding chronic pain and how it can be conservatively managed. Um, so because we couldn't help or um, you couldn't experience pain or we couldn't inflict pain on you, we decided the next best thing. We thought we'd show you some pictures to see if we can elicit some maybe pain and some neurons firing in your brain and maybe some of these pictures maybe remind you of something that's happened to you in your life. I hope not, okay? I hope not this hasn't happened to you, but I don't know about you, but that looks pretty painful to me. I am not sure if he was injured or not, but he did get it on camera, and he will be able to watch that again on repeat, so that's good. What about this? Anyone here can relate to this picture? Are there any women in the crowd? Absolutely. So, I don't know. I haven't been there yet, okay, but so I don't exactly know how that feels, but it looks pretty painful to me. What about this one? Anyone fall off their bike? Hmm. This one is more, I don't know, he hasn't actually hit the ground yet, so he may not have been hurt, I don't know, right? But who knows? And what about this one? Who here thinks this looks painful? Right? To me, that's a form of torture, okay? I do not think that's, I don't think that would be fun. He looks pretty content, if you ask me. So obviously, he didn't, doesn't really think this is, this is painful. So what all these pictures display, this is just to get your attention and also to kind of display that everyone experiences pain very differently, okay? Everyone experiences pain, period. We are human beings. That is a part of us that are connected, that, is, that connects us all as human beings is pain, fortunately and unfortunately, which we'll talk about today. Um, having pain throughout life is completely normal. We cannot escape it. Living in pain is not normal, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about today and hope that you are able to understand that by the end of this hour. So what we're going to go through today, a brief history of pain, got to look back to how we got here, um, understanding pain from a neuroscience approach, so the how, the why, the what, okay, the difference between ac acute and chronic, because it is different, uh, defining what biopsychosocial means, and lastly, some ways to conservatively manage it. So what can you do about all this, and what can you do with all the information we give you today? So but first, a few facts. Um, I like facts. I like numbers. Um, but this is just, this, the first one just kind of stands out, I think, um, just huge to me. One in five people. So one in five U.S. adults are experiencing pain currently. That's 20%. So if you think about that for a minute, that's more than cancer, heart disease, and uh, diabetes combined. All right? That's huge. So it is not a little problem that we can just continue to ignore. All right? Um, there is a higher prevalence among advancing age, and also this is an interesting fact that there is a higher, um, cr people who have higher education actually have lower, cr lower chronic pain. So there's a correlation between education levels and chronic pain, um, and we will talk about that and address that later in the presentation of why we think that is the case. So it also can be linked to lots of things, as mentioned here. So disability, anxiety, stress, opioid dependency, okay? I think that's a, um, I know in the media, and if anyone was here last summer and listened to Dr. Butler's uh, uh, lecture, he talked a lot about that and the issues that Alaska is having specifically. And lastly, it's estimated that it's $560 billion annually is what we are spending. This is U.S. USA is spending that much money annually on chronic pain. So we, we need to address this and try to figure out how can we decrease all of these, all of these facts, all these statistics. So 6% of low back pain, so this is specifically low back, not just chronic pain in general, 6% of low back pain sufferers consume more than 50% of all the costs associated with it, all right? Um, and then 10% of any kind of disability claims lead to 86% of the total cost, okay? Let that sink in for a minute. So very small portion of people are utilizing a lot of the Medicare or just or, um, uh, dollars, the, it's the healthcare dollars, excuse me. 
So here's a few uh, graphs just to kind of, of course, uh, uh, show this or display it in a different ways. So the first on the left is the number of workers on disability. So as you can see, a very gradual increase from back in the 60s up into the uh, 2010s, 2012. So a gradual steady incline. It is not going back down. The, vis uh, the, uh, the one on the right shows the trend in physician visits for back pain specifically. So we are having more and more pain. So even as we are spending $560 billion a year, gosh, you think we're spending anything with uh, that much money on anything, we'd get a good result, right? No, we're not. So what are we doing wrong? So even though the disability is going up and people are going to the doctor more, it's not, nothing is, seems to be helping, right? Um, the next slide is one of my favorites that I found in doing research for this presentation. I'm excited to kind of talk about. I found it in the International Journal of Frustration of 2019. <laughs> the blue line, if you can see, is the rates of chronic pain. It keeps increasing. The orange line, beer consumption by healthcare providers. Hmm. It also is increasing at the same rate. All right, so now let's go back a little bit. So to understand where we are today and kind of even to start planning for the future, we got to look back to our history. So just a quick uh, information or quick uh, review of history of pain. So it started back, one of the earliest documentation that we have um, is Aristotle. He talked about the passion of the soul. So he really brought it, he really thought it was the soul was the main um, culprit, if you will, when we, when we have pain. Hi Hippocrates, fluid imbalance. Prior to the Renaissance, it was a very religious or spiritual c component to it, and it was believed to be more of a punishment from God. Um, Chinese medicine, yin and yang, we're pretty uh, familiar with that. The energy flows when that came in, uh, into play. And that brings us to the Renaissance period, to the Cartesian model of pain. So Rene Descartes, he is a 17th century uh, French philosopher, really smart guy in a lot of things. Um, but he got pain really wrong. And unfortunately, his model of pain is really what has shaped modern, modern medicine even today. So he's still very um, around in our century in terms of the, the impact he had on his theories. Um, so he believed, his approach was very linear. He believed that you put your foot in a fire, for instance, like this picture, then there was a hollow tube in our body that actually sent little spirits up, it rang a little bell, and caused pain in our brain. Um, so it was a very linear approach. He was the first one to talk about the involvement of the brain with pain, so that was maybe one thing he kind of got right, okay? Um, but other than that, he didn't, he didn't get it all right. So after that, coming into the 1800s, we had a lot more scientific discoveries. So the microscopes, okay? So we had a big, huge advancement in microbiology, which is great. It gave us a lot of new information. So we discovered receptors, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So this is a very good thing. We discovered, hey, there's different types of receptors. But at that point, what that, what that kind of caused is that it looked, it, 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 pain was then seen as just simply as an overstimulation of these receptors, and that's it. So very sl simple explanation, but again, not very holistic. Didn't didn't um, answer or uh, all the all the information or give everything. So what's wrong with Rene? So the Rene theory, there was many things wrong with it. So first, he thought there was a direct link between the amount of tissue damage and the level of pain experienced. And we're going to talk, and Jake's actually going to talk here a little bit to, to explain to you why that is not correct. Okay, all pain. He believed all pain is caused by injury by physical damage, you put your foot in the fire, it causes pain, oh, well, that's simple, just take the foot out of the fire, right? And then it doesn't hurt anymore. We know that doesn't really work anymore, or that's not the case with chronic pain. Uh, pain is either physical or mental, so it was very separated. He did not believe that it was combined, um, and he believed that the tissues are not healing, so if you still had pain, it's still very, um, that foot must still be in the fire if you're still feeling pain. There must be still damage. And last, he talked about nociception and pain were the same thing. And I'm going to talk about in a minute that they're not. So all of these are incorrect theories about pain. So coming forward again, 1990s, hey, big thing happened. We discovered brain scans. This, is, this was very good medical technology, medical uh, discovery, FR, uh, functional MRIs, PET scans, CT scans, great, this is great. And this is when we first started being able to detect and discover really that, wow, when people are in pain, there's actually things happening in the brain. There's cortical changes that are happening. Now we can document it and prove it. So this was huge, okay? This is huge in terms of the pain science. 
So what do we know now? Where are we? We know 100% without a doubt, fact, all the signs is uh, pointing toward it that pain is produced in the brain. Okay? Um, and we are going to spend the rest of the talk explaining and hopefully convincing you that this is absolute truth. Okay? So again, we are now, so kind of talked about um, poor Rene, he, his theory does not explain all of pain. There's parts of it that do explain some parts of acute pain, but is not holistic. It does not take into, uh, uh, into account the complexity. And pain is so complex, we are really just kind of starting, scratching the surface, if you will, of the science behind it. It's very exciting. Almost daily, we're getting new neuroscience of pain, which is just leading into more opportunities for treatment and research and, um, and, and so forth. So it's very, very exciting uh, field to be in right now. So one, we're going to quickly go over pain neuroscience 101. So this is hopefully going to lay the basis and the foundation for you to understand pain to, for the rest of the, to the talk today. So as you see here, pain most, almost always starts with some kind of stimulus. In this example, in our skin, it can be a mechanical stimulus, like pressure or touch. It can be thermal, so it can be hot or cold. So we have little receptors in our skin. They're called nociceptors. Okay? These little receptors, think of them as transducers. Okay? So just like this microphone is like a transducer. It's turning my sound waves into electrical impulses and turning into sound that you can hear. We have these little transducers all throughout our skin. They're called nociceptors, okay? So they take that mechanical stimulus of the touch or the thermal um, chemical, the thermal, um, uh, thermal energy, sorry, as the hot and cold, changes it into electrical impulse, okay? And it sends a message on the nerve through our, uh, down through our nerves, through our spinal cord, crosses over, up to our brain, into our thalamus. Think about your thalamus as the grand st central station of your brain. So that's where all the information goes, and then from here, it gets sent to the most appropriate part in our brain, whether it be the motor cortex or the prefrontal cortex or the somatosensory and all that kind of stuff, right? So it gets sent to the brain. Here, once it gets sent to its appropriate destination, that is where pain is experienced. That is where pain is formed, if you will. And that is how the brain is involved in, in, in that process. The other thing we need to think about or, or know about that's a very important part of this process is we also have what we call the descending inhibitory pathway. So kind of fancy words, but really all it means, it's kind of like a, uh, a filtering system. So if you think about all the information that's constantly coming into our brain daily, seconds, every right now, there's millions and billions of receptors and neurons firing, just you sitting there in your seat, okay, against so you feel the there's little mechanical receptors or transducers firing, telling your brain, hey, you're sitting in a chair. Hey, you're sitting in a chair. Hey, you're sitting in a chair. And it's just gonna keep firing, keep firing, keep firing. Well, if the brain actually received all of that information, all of the time, your brain would literally explode, right? So we have this filtering process that helps damper down some of that information coming up. And it acts like a closed uh, feedback loop to keep everything check and balance, keep everything going in line and help prevent an overstimulation of information, unnecessary information that maybe the brain doesn't need to know about at this point, okay? Out of the way so that you can focus on what you need to focus on. Right now you need to focus on me, right? So their brain is allowing all those, those information that's coming up. I don't want to focus on that. Hey, I want to focus on this presentation. So very quick kind of summary. Um, so there's two things I want to kind of just briefly talk about that kind of a few misconceptions I find are very common within the, the medical world and even just within the patient population as well is the idea of pain receptors and pain pathways, okay? So first, pain receptors. We hear this a lot and a lot of us actually believe I was pretty much taught this and 10 years ago when I went through physical therapy school, that we had receptors in our skin and nerves, but that we had pain receptors. We do not. We just talked about we have nociceptors. Okay? We have receptors that take information. Think of it that they take all the information and then they send a danger message to the brain. So if you scratch yourself, it sends a danger message to your brain and says, hey brain, guess what? You were just scratched. What should you do about it? The brain takes that information and decides, well, what should I do about it, right? So we do not have pain sensors. We have nociceptors, okay? Because pain is not produced in your skin or your nerves. It's produced up here in your brain, okay? And secondly, pain pathways. We used to believe, and I was even taught this in physical therapy school 10 years ago, that pain most commonly traveled on what's called the C fibers or the delta C fibers. So if you think of these, these are the primary afferent axons. Fancy word for different parts of your nerves, okay? So these are the nerves that send the information up. Think of them as highways, OK? 
okay? So you're driving, most of us, okay, we want, maybe you want to go in the fast lane. If you had pain, if you want to tell your, tell your brain something, some very important information, would you want to travel in the slow lane or the fast lane? Probably the fast lane, right? We used to think that most pain traveled along the delta C fibers. That's actually the slow lane because it's not myelinated. It just means it slows everything down. So either way, we do not have pain pathways. We do not have pain nerves. We have different pathways that all information um, goes to the brain. So to kind of summarize that, to think about it a little bit more simplistically, um, think of it a three-step process. So we have the input, we have the processing component, and then we have the output, okay? So that, what is the input? The input is that nociception that we just talked about. It's all those little receptors in our skin. So any kind of information that's coming in goes to the brain. Guess what? It's not just about what's in our skin and what's in our nerves, right? The input is also cognitive, anxiety, fear, emotions, okay? So those are also other inputs that are coming in. So then what is the processing? We kind of touched on this, is the what happens in that brain. This is where everything happens. Think about a, a CEO of a really uh, important, I don't know, IBM, okay? And he's in this big, tall building, in the, and he's, of course, the CEO of IBM is going to be the penthouse at the top of the building. And his job is to make really big decisions on the best, what's going to be the best for his company. And every day he's receiving information. He's receiving phone calls, texts, faxes about all the information. And he needs to take all the information and make big decisions. That's what our brain does. All it does is take the information up. All those electrical impulses that are constantly being flowed up into, into our brain, it's the brain that then says, okay, what am I going to do about this? Am I threatened? Is this information that's coming into my brain, am I threatened by this? Is this dangerous information? If it says yes, this is dangerous, well guess what? The output is going to be pain. Does that make sense? So pain, it determines if there is danger, it may produce pain, it may not. And Jake's going to talk about that in a little bit. So another example of this input process output is vision. Okay, same thing, same concept. Vision is, light comes in, so right now, light is coming into my eyes, coming into your eyes, okay? It's just light waves. They hit the back of our retina, again, gets transferred into um, electrical energy, via, and then sends, sends electrical impulse along our nerves up to our brain. Our brain then takes information, and guess what? It sees, that's what, how, we, how we interpret these pictures. Hearing's the same way, sound waves into our ears, gets transferred into what we perceive as sound, okay? So then with all this input processing, then what is the outputs? I'm gonna hand it off to Jake. No, 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 no. Thank you, I'm, I'm just starting. So, what is the output? The reason why you're all here today, pain. Pain is the output, all right? But what is pain in simple terms? Well, according to, according to the International Association for the Study of Pain, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience which follows actual or potential tissue damage. Now, there's two points in there that are very important. Sensory and emotional experience. The emotional experience is often overlooked. And finally, actual or potential tissue damage. You do not need tissue damage in order to experience pain. And we'll go over this later in the presentation. Now, there are two main components of pain, acute pain and chronic pain. So just to make sure that you guys have an understanding of what we're talking about, we'll go over those now. Acute pain. This is pain that happens when the insult occurs up to 12 weeks, okay? Acute pain is very good. Acute pain is telling us something has happened to your body and this needs to be addressed. I know a lot of people don't want to experience pain, but I can guarantee you, if your appendix ruptures, you really want to feel pain, so you can go to the ER and get it addressed. Otherwise, you're probably gonna die of sepsis. If you accidentally lean on a hot stove, the only way that you're gonna be able to tell is by hearing your skin sizzle, all right? Pain is very important. It protects us. So, acute pain is pain that happens from the insult up to 12 weeks. Chronic pain happens after that time. So it's past 12 weeks, up to three to six months. So we're well into the last phase of tissue healing, but we're still experiencing this pain, right? It's not likely a warning of possible, possible injury or danger. Your brain might be causing you to hurt, even though 
the tissue that was damaged is currently well into the last phase of tissue healing. Your nervous system becomes hypersensitized to experiencing pain. Unfortunately, what can happen is that you get good at feeling pain. That's not a thing that you want to be good at, but when you experience pain all the time, you have a lot of practice at it. When you have a lot of practice at something, you get good at it. But how do we help this? Well, one of the ways that we can help it is realizing that acute pain and chronic pain are two separate disease processes, all right? Two diseases need to be treated two separate ways. If I treated chicken pox the same way that I treated smallpox, I would, be, I would end up in a bad way. I'm not about to invite people over to my house to have a smallpox party, all right? You don't treat smallpox by taking an oatmeal bath. It's much more severe than that. If I treated rheumatoid arthritis the same way I treated osteoarthritis, I could end up resulting in a lot of joint uh, deformations, okay? So acute pain and chronic pain, they sound similar, but they're not, so they need to be treated differently. An easy way to remember this is to think of pain as an alarm system, okay? Acute pain, if your door gets broken down, that's an insult to your house. So your alarm's gonna go off. Hey, the door's broken, you need to get this fixed. Okay, I fixed it, but I don't want my door to break again. So I'm gonna jack up my alarm system because it was a really big pain in the butt to go out and buy the door and fit it and everything like that. So your alarm system's jacked up because you don't want your door broke again. Now all of a sudden, a stiff breeze comes through and your alarm system goes off. But you check your door, the door looks fine. It's no big deal, but the alarm's still going off. That's because the alarm has been jacked up because your body's trying to protect you because it doesn't want to experience the insult from the door getting broke down in the first place. So one of the things that we need to do is think about turning that alarm system down so it can go off at the appropriate time. The way that we do this is utilizing something called the biopsychosocial approach. All right? This is a new approach, which is put in quotations because time is relative, um, where we try to treat the whole person instead of just the symptoms. Okay? There are three major aspects that go into the biopsychosocial bio approach, which we'll break down now. So, first off, bio. That stands for biological, all right? This is a medical aspect, and we are very, very good at this. Very good, all right? If your heart doesn't beat when it's supposed to beat, that's okay, we have a pacemaker. If your body doesn't produce insulin when you eat sugar, that's okay, you can just inject it. If your kidneys don't do what they're supposed to do, that's okay, you can just go to dialysis. We have this down. We're extremely good at the biological component, all right? And it is also very important. We need this thing, because if we do have a major issue, we need to go and get it checked out so we can make sure that we're okay. That's only one slice of the pie. The other slice would be the psycho or psychological component. This is, your, this is a psychological aspect. This has things to do with your mental health, your emotional health, coping skills, stress and anxiety. Everyone here has felt this before. When you've been stressed out, a lot of people call it being on edge, all right? And someone can say, uh, you know, I feel on edge when I'm driving in the Fred Meyer parking lot, okay? It's, it's too small and everyone doesn't need a Ford F-350 with a mega cab and an extra long bed and then I have to weave between here. And then my wife said, there's a parking spot right there. I know, it was right there. I just didn't want to park right there. I'm on edge because I don't want to get dinged. This is a threat. And if your body experiences a threat, it's going to respond in a way that tries to get you out of that situation. Oftentimes, that's pain. And oftentimes, that's overlooked. Social, all right? This is your cultural beliefs. Everyone comes from a different background. Did you come from a stoic background where Everyone is always very quiet and very prideful. Did you come from a gregarious background where everyone's always very boisterous? This plays a big role in how you experience pain. What are your fam family dynamics? Were you the youngest in the family? Was the only way that you were able to get attention by getting hurt? This plays a role in how you experience pain later on in your life, and it's very real, all right? Your past history, how did you first experience the pain? Did you trip and fall playing sports? Did you hurt your back on the job and then lost your job? Did you experience the pain because you're abused by a significant other? These things play a role 
and how we experience pain on down the line. And it does a disservice to the patient if we overlook them. So, we have to appreciate that pain is filtered through an individual's genetic composition, their prior learning history, current psychosocial status, and sociocultural influences, and many, many, many more things. Pain isn't just tissue damage and then pain, all right? Tissue damage can occur in the absence of pain. Like Rachel was saying, your brain's like the command center, all right? And every single time we have an input, it's, ex it's taking into account a whole bunch of things that we, we can't even appreciate in real time. It's taking into account your current environment, past experiences, what is happening in the body right now, and when we try to treat chronic pain, we need to remember this. So like I say, there are many different slices of a pie, but not all slices of the biopsychosocial pie are created equal. If I fall right now and break my leg, I'm probably more into pie one there with the bio, okay? Let's say for example that I experienced my injury because of some type of assault or abuse or something like that. My pie is gonna be more like that in the psych component, okay? So they're not, not everyone is the same. Everyone experiences pain differently and we need to appreciate this when it's being treated. So the biomedical approach. This is what modern medicine typically focuses on, all right? They wanna focus on the tissue issue. Your back hurts, you have a bulging disc, that's okay. I just go inside and I take care of that bulging disc and your pain's gone. Well, this isn't always the case. We all know people who have had a surgery that's failed, okay? If it was just a tissue issue and you had a surgery and that tissue was addressed, the surgery would work, but it doesn't. And that's not the fault of the surgeon or the patient or anybody like that. It's just that there is more to chronic pain than just the tissue issue, okay? There's a way that we can prove this, that pain is not always the same as tissue injury. Who here has had a paper cut? How bad do they hurt? Badly. How big is the cut? Teeny tiny. So tiny that sometimes when you get a paper cut, you actually need to squeeze your finger to see if you're gonna bleed. But it still hurts very, very badly, all right? Now, what I do for a living is gonna de determine how much I experience this pain. If I'm a violinist, that's much more threatening to me on how I can do my job. It's annoying to, string, to finger the strings if, when I'm playing the violin if I have a paper cut. So that's gonna be more of a threat to me. As a result, I'm gonna experience more pain. If I play soccer and I never use my hands and I get a paper cut, I'm not gonna experience as much pain, right? The flip side is also true. If I'm crossing the road and I fall and I break my ankle, all right, and then I see a speeding truck coming for me, my brain is going to process what's most important in this current time, okay? Should I lay on the ground and grab my ankle and get smushed by the truck or should I get out of the road? I need to get out of the road. So my brain is gonna prioritize what it needs to do and then it's going to create the output because if we remember, pain is an output. My brain doesn't want me to get squished. My brain wants me to get off the road. I have a lot of adrenaline in my system. I get up and I leave, all right? Later on, I'm most likely gonna experience pain because I do have a broken ankle. You see this when you watch sports. How many times have you seen an, an NFL lineman come off, he's walking off, one of his uh, buddies points at his finger and says, whoa, you got a dislocated finger there. He brings his hand up and looks, oh, I didn't even know that. Large amount of tissue damage, dislocated finger. So little pain that he doesn't even realize that it happened. So pain is not always the same thing as tissue injury, all right? There are many people who have degenerative tissues with very, to little, very little to no pain. There's also many, many people who have significant amount of pain, but when you look at an MRI finding, their tissues look what's considered normal. This doesn't mean that the pain isn't real. The pain is very real, but looking at tissue damage is only one component of why we experience these symptoms. We have studies to prove this, all right? A third of the uh, people who have no symptoms of pain in their shoulder, um, a third of them over the age of 30 have an abnormal MRI finding, all right? If we go up to 70, two thirds of those people no shoulder pain whatsoever, abnormal MRI finding, okay? 
On the flip side of that, among people who have had a successful surgery and no pain, regained all their movement, the functions there, one in five still have a muscular tear. The tissue injury is there. The tissue damage is there. No dysfunction. The knee. 25 to 50% of MRIs show knee degeneration in pain-free people. All right? If you use your body, like you're playing basketball, 35% of collegiate basketball players have knee degeneration without pain. Back surgery. This one's extremely common. It's been well documented that at least a third of lumbar surgery patients continue to have significant persistent pain, disability, and functional loss. All right? There's many reasons why a surgery could fail. Okay? I don't know how many times I've had a patient tell me, my doctor told me to do this. And I just know that that's not true. If you had a major lumbar surgery and you're carrying two bags of quickcrete up a flight of stairs, your doctor didn't say that that was okay to do right after your surgery. So it could be patient noncompliance for a failure of the surgery. It could be a physician error for the failure for the surgery, okay? But what we see is, a lot of the time, before we get to CERT, we don't even need to go that route, right? So this is a systematic review by the American Society of Neuroradiology, found absence of pain with spine degeneration. So the degeneration is there, there is no pain, all right? They looked at 33 papers and over 3,100 subjects, all right? So the occurrence of disc degeneration in healthy, pain-free individuals was 37% for people in their 20s, 96% for people in their 80s. Almost everyone, if you're 80, have some disc degeneration in healthy, pain-free individuals. 50% uh, of asymptomatic individuals, 30 to 39 years of age, have disc degeneration, height loss, or disc bulging. So this suggests that even in young adults, degenerative changes may be incidental and not causally related presenting to their symptoms, all right? We can look at this on a chart. Older we get, all the way through on disc degeneration, these are pain-free individuals, okay? All the way down. This makes sense if you think about it. As time goes on and as you use your body, wear and tear is bound to happen. It's much like rust on a car. There's nothing that you can do to stop rust from crit forming on a car if you use it, okay? There's a lot of things that you can slow it down. There's a lot of things that you can do to treat it after the fact. But the fact of the matter is the rust is coming. It doesn't mean the car doesn't run well. The car runs just fine. But there's normal wear and tear on something if you use it. Finally, the spine. This is a study out of Japan where they looked at MRI findings in uh, over 1,200 healthy asymptomatic people, all right? 73% of males and 78% of females in their 20s had a bulging disc. Pain-free, high majority had tissue damage, no pain. Of those 73 and 78%, only 5% of these asymptomatic subjects were diagnosed with the spinal cord compression, okay? So it's dangerous to make interventional decisions based on the findings of an MRI alone. An MRI is a very, very valuable tool, and it should be used if you feel like something's going on. But it's only one piece of the puzzle because we have to remember to treat the whole person. All right, so just continuing on with that, so I want to just... Um, clarify that what Jake is saying and what we both are saying is we are not poo-pooing on the biomedical system. It's very, very important, okay? MRIs are very important, okay? Um, but it's still one piece of that puzzle, okay? Biopsychosocial, we can't just look at the bio, okay? There are some, even with chronic pain, there are some bio issues that we need to address. There might be some tight muscles, some weak muscles that we need to help, but we can't just look at that, all right? 
So kind of comparing the two systems, the bio, biomedical and biopsychosocial, kind of the older way, kind of now compared to the newer way of what we need to and the, where we really need to be focusing our treatment in the future. Um, it's kind of like treating the symptoms. Biomedical is very heavy on, okay, what are the symptoms versus biopsychosocial, looking more at the whole person. Okay, the bio tends to focus more on those passive techniques. So here's a pill. Let's do surgeries, MRI, CT scans. Again, not a bad thing but not necessarily needs to be addressed in every single situation and not only looking at that, okay? So we can't just look at the tissues only. So tissue issues can and do, of course, result in pain, okay? But overall, the, the overall message is that pain is far more complex than that. We cannot base our treatment on the bio um, symptoms alone. So this is actually a really cool uh, case study I came across when we were actually preparing for this to kind of talk about MRI. So this was a 63-year-old woman. She actually went and had, she had low back pain, chronic low back pain with radicular symptoms, which just basically means referred pain down her leg, okay? So she went to, got 10 different MRIs at 10 different locations within a three-week period, okay? So pretty close to each other. This actually was done in New York City, not here. <laughs> So, but of those 10 MRIs, there were 49 different diagnoses, 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 that they found on, in this study. That's in, ridiculous. That's, I think that's crazy. And zero, zero findings were consistent on all 10. Not one single MRI had the single uh, common diagnosis. There was one that, had, that was found in nine of the 10. So what this study concluded is that basically it found a, a marked variability in the reported interpretive findings of an MRI, okay? The authors conclude that how an MRI inter is interpreted by the radiologist may have a direct impact, impact on the diagnosis and of course, therefore, the subsequent treatment choices, okay? So this is not saying that MRIs are bad. This is all saying that how can we dictate how someone is going to be treated by looking at that one picture alone. We can't do it. One picture does not tell the whole story. Anybody know, can everyone make a guess? Is this a male or female? Is this a 30 year old? Is this a 70 year old? I have no clue. And if anyone in this room right now could tell me that they think you're, I think you're just, you're, 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 you're I don't know, you're insane probably, because it's impossible. We can't tell those things. So how can we dictate what this person needs, surgery, not surgery, uh, medication, not medication, based on one single picture, okay? So we gotta look more holistic than that. So this is actually a quote by one of my professors. Um, he's actually won um, his, his institute and his research, uh, he's doing a lot of the main research actually that's leading a lot of the neuroscience um, uh, in, in the world today and in the US today. So what he said is, patients want to, know about, want to know more about pain. So he says, think about it. A patient comes to you seeking help for pain and you teach them fit patient anatomy. No wonder pain rates in the US have doubled in the last 15 years alone. Never before have we performed as much surgery or prescribed as much medicine for pain in the history of mankind and pain rates are ever increasing. That was as uh, Adrian Lowe said that. So as, as a physical therapist and as a, in the medical field, we need to start addressing pain, right? Not just the tissue issues or the anatomy. So to bring that all down, we really, in today's world, we have this dichotomy, we have this problem that we do, we do not have a tissue problem, I would argue, okay? We have a pain problem. So we need to address that accordingly. So here comes the point of presentation. Okay, now you have all the information. Okay, so what? Well, what can I do about it or what can you do about it? So with all the research, there's really, um, really four foundational pillars, if you will, that are an absolute must that you need to focus on when treating chronic pain. Okay? There are many, 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 many other things. We could talk for hours about everything that we could do. These are the primary foundational four that have to be addressed okay, to start. Number one is education. Um, so a little to kind of a, to give you a little analogy or story of kind of to understand why education is so important. Um, show of hands, anyone here afraid of the dark? If anyone here afraid of the dark as a child? <laughs> okay, or maybe still afraid of the dark a little bit. <laughs> um, so I was afraid of the dark as a child, okay? What's so scary about the dark? Is the dark going to hurt me? No. 
Usually when I ask that, I've asked that before, and somebody in the back said, vitamin D deficiency can cause, you know, bone. I'm like, okay, smart. That's all right. So other than vitamin D deficiency, how does the dark actually harm us? It doesn't. It's what's in the dark that is so scary. When I was a kid, maybe the boogeyman was under my bed. Maybe there was an ax murderer in my closet. I don't know. It's what's in the dark that is scary. So by educating people, kind of what we're doing with you, exactly what we're doing with you today, it's helping turn on the lights to make sure, hey, there's nothing scary under your bed, okay? So reducing that fear. A quote here that both Jake and I really like is, that which you use to avoid your pain will end up becoming the source of your pain. So we tend to start avoiding certain things because we're fearful of them. Okay? That leads into this concept of fear again. So fear is again, the definition is just a very distressing negative experience. Okay? So fear is something that can be, um, can be very, uh, most people have, most patients sorry, are, have a lot of fear, whether they recognize it as fear or they don't. Um, and fear, in, increased fear can, can actually um, uh, produce catastrophization. Oh, I got that word right on the first try. It always takes me one or two. Catastrophization. So what catastrophization is, is really like an amplitude or uh, intense irrational fear, almost like a phobia, okay? And when we have high catastrophization as a patient who is experiencing chronic pain, it actually increases the nervous system, the sensitivity of your nervous system, like Jake talked about the alarm, it increases that dial of your, of your alarm system and literally makes it more sensitive, okay? It amplifies all that information, all the electrical information coming in, it amplifies it. So then you're going to experience more pain, all because of fear and catastrophization, okay? So to kind of show how we can change that or affect that with education, there's just one study that was done. It was a randomized control trial, and it was they divided patients into two groups. Okay, and they all had back pain. Um, so once one group were educated on the neuroscience of pain, much like I'm kind of doing with you right now, um, and then the second group they were they were educated with the traditional anatomy. Okay, so what they did before they educated everyone, it was a three hour. They did everyone one on one with the physical therapist educated them for three hours. Before they educated them, they measured a bunch of outcome measures that helped measure the, what their fear, what their catastrophization is, what their pain is. And they also looked at their function. They said, okay, go ahead and bend over. And they measured how far they could go. They said, okay, lay down, go lift your leg up. Tell me when you feel pain and they stop. So they measured a couple functional measures. So what do you think happened after they educated these two groups? Okay. The group that had the neuroscience education Okay, not the anatomy education, the neuroscience showed a dramatic increase, so their attitudes and beliefs about pain changed, a reduction in that catastrophization and that fear, and even more important, this is just so, I think this is so excited, I get so excited when I talk about this, it improved their function. So just literally educating these people who had pain, they had improved straight, or sorry, forward bend, and significant improvement on how far they could raise their leg. So the knowledge is power. Reducing fear, giving and empowering people about pain, it actually is like, okay, oh, I, don't, I mean, I don't need to be, I don't need to be scared about the little bit of soreness and discomfort in my back when I, when I move or when I bend. Oh, okay, well then I'm going to, oh, I'm going to bend over and pick up my kid again then, which I haven't done in a year because I've been so scared that that pain meant I had something significantly wrong, right? So it allows people to get back to their life, right? So again, kind of looking at that fear aspect, this is called the fear avoidance model. So a lot of times what, when we have an injury, or we have a painful experience, there's kind of two roads you can take. You can take the road on I guess the left, okay? If you have high fear, high catastrophization, you don't know what just happened, okay? You're going to, that high fear is gonna to lead to avoidance. I'm so scared, I don't wanna do that activity. I picked up my, I'm scared if I pick up my child, I might hurt my back, right? So that avoidance leads to dis disability, more disuse, and guess what? That leads to more pain. You know where this is going? It leads to more catastrophization, more fear, more avoidance, right? And just on and on and on, right? So how do we break that cycle? That's where education comes in. If we break that cycle and help reduce their fear, okay, people who have a painful experience, I might uh, hurt my back or my back's been hurting for a long time, I have less fear. I'm like, oh, I don't need to be as fearful about 
this back injury. Maybe, you know, I went and got it cleared, got checked, saw a physical therapist. There's this great one named Rachel over at FMH and Jake, FY. So they went to her and him, and she said, realized, okay, there's nothing wrong with my back. Every, all the big red flags have been cleared out. Okay, so I mean, it must mean this pain. Okay, there's nothing wrong with my back. Oh, so I have less fear. I can, I can confront whatever it is I need to confront and go towards the road of, of recovery, right? So another example, another um, a scientific study, this is another one, another uh, randomized control trial. And so this actually looked at, okay, well, we, if education is so powerful, what if we combine education with physical therapy, with more traditional movement-based you know, activity? And of course, they found it had a significant reduction in pain and disability, okay? But the, the key part of the study I wanna point out is this numbers needed to treat. So what numbers needed to treat means is how, when you have a intervention, um, how many people do you need to treat to get one positive outcome? So this study found to have a positive outcome in terms of impro improve your function, it's a two to one. So if you take two people with pain and, 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 and combined physical therapy with education, you're guaranteed that one of them will get better, right? And with pain, three people, if you take three people, you're guaranteed that one of those people, just from education alone, is actually going to have an improvement, right? And just to kind of compare this to some medication, so gabapentin, antidepressant, I'm not saying that these are bad, these are actually really good medications that are appropri when appropriately used, but for gabapentin, it takes, so you had to treat six people before you, to get one positive outcome, all right? So these, we, these lower numbers are good, right? Less risk. Okay, so the next one I'm talking about, this one is I'm really excited about. So this is, um, was a case study and we're brought in the brain and it looked at, it, they did functional MRIs. So it was a 30 year old uh, woman with low back pain, again, some referring pain down her, her leg. And they did three MRIs. The first MRI they did with her in the machine, laying there nice and still. So they got a nice pretty picture of just what her back looks like nice and still. The second one, they put her back in the machine and they said, okay, I want you to do something that's painful. What causes your pain? And for this patient, it was lumbar extension or arching her back. So she laid in, this, in the MRI and they said, okay, go ahead. And she starts arching her back as she's laying there, very painful, and they recorded what the brain did. Then they did, they took her out of the MRI, and this was done again by physical therapists, and they sat her down and for 30 minutes, again, kind of like we're doing now, educated her on the neuroscience of pain, input, process, output, tissue, issue does not equal pain, hurt does not equal harm. Kind of gave her this education, put her right back into the MRI 30 minutes later, okay, 30 minutes later, and they said, okay, do that same stimulus. Put her in the MRI and they said, okay, start arching your back, okay? And then they looked at her brain scans. These are her brain scans, okay? So what, it, what the result was, the patient displayed decreased catastrophization, disability, and also, again, improved functions. They also tested her forward bend and her straight leg raise as well. Those all improved. But what the coolest thing about this study is that it actually looked at the cortical changes in the brain. So the one on the left, and it's a little hard to see, the one on the left is her when she, before the education when she was doing the painful ouch. Ouch, that hurts. And if you see all the little red blobs, okay, all the little red blobs, a very scientific term, red blobs, okay, all of that is the uh, basically recording all the oxygen, all the cortical, all the metabolic changes in the brain that occur. So lots of activity. Lots of activity means the brain is really active, there's a lot going on, okay? It's sensitivity, it's like it's the, the alarm system is going off. Then the one beside it was the, sec the third one. After the education, they put it back in in the same stimulus and look at this, the reduction of that cortical um, activity was significantly decreased with 30 minutes of just ed education, right? This is awesome. I don't know, I get really excited. Anyone else? Can I get an amen? <laughs> okay, this is powerful stuff. This is very powerful stuff. So just to kind of summarize, there was a, uh, uh, another really good systematic review recently, 2016, where they took pretty much all the studies that have happened up till now about neuroscience and therapy and conservative management education. And basically the conclusion, I think this sums up everything really nicely. The results of this updated review, so p and &E, sorry, means uh, pain neuroscience education for muscular skeletal pain. Um, so basically education provides 
strong evidence for, for education, sorry, this review, okay, provides strong evidence for pain education to reduce pain, improve patient knowledge of pain, improve function, lower disability, reduce psychosocial factors, enhance movement, minimize healthcare utilization. Holy crap, what else could you want, right? And a million dollars, maybe, right? It's the only way that that could be better. So very good, just kind of summary of Education, education, education is so important. All right. Um, so the second pillar is aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise is anything that gets that heart pumping. Okay. So this is really, really important because the nervous system needs blood. Our bodies, of course, need blood. Our nervous system, cool fact, okay, is about only weighs about three percent of our total body body weight. It's only three percent. So our brain, our spinal cord, our nerves only really weigh about three percent. Not very much, right? Really important organ, very small, but it utilizes 33% of our blood flow. Wow, right? Little bit of our body, a lot of our blood flow, right? So it's super important to get that blood flow going. And that's just that normal rest. Imagine if your nervous system or that alarm system is super elevated, it's going to need more blood flow to help decrease it. Those nerves are hungry, they need that blood flow. So what are you gonna do about it? You need to get some aerobic exercise. This does not mean that I expect everyone to sign up for the Equinox Marathon, okay? You do not need to take extreme measures. What the science shows is that you only need about 100 to 110 beats per minute of your heart, okay, to get this, this benefit. So really, that's a brisk walk. Resting heart rate is around 60 to 100, 80 to 100 resting heart rate. Everyone's a little different. So this is really just above resting heart rate, a gentle walk. And maybe go for a gentle bike ride, a swimming, okay? Just get that heart pumping. So when we do aerobic exercise in the clinic with both Jake and I, we both come across kind of one or basically two things that tend to often happen um, with people with chronic pain. They kind of fall into one, or two, one of two of camps, if you will. The first one is this no pain, no gain, where they push. I have pain, but I, I'm pushing through it because that's what I was told, that pain is weakness leaving the body. I'm going to push through it. That's not going to do you any good. If that alarm system is elevated, if your nervous system is super sensitive and you keep pushing into that pain, guess what? You're causing that alarm system to stay way up here. You might even be increasing it, okay? So that's not going to do you any good. The second one is if, if it hurts, don't do it. So those are the people who fall into that fear avoidance, who I'm so afraid of pain, I don't want to feel, I can't do anything, I'm just going to sit on my couch, okay? Um, don't be this guy, okay? So it says, what fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead for 24, okay? Don't be that guy, right? Do a little bit. So what do, then what's the answer here? We want to be, you know, halfway in the middle. It's okay, we, it's okay to touch it, tease it nudge it. Start low, go slow. Maybe you start at two minutes, great. Two minutes of a gentle walk, great. Guess what? You keep repeating that and you're going to slowly see progress. I show this a lot to my patients, this picture on the right, um, because I have a lot of patients, especially chronic pain patients, who we may do something and it causes a flare-up. And we say, oh, okay, this may have happened. Sometimes we might, we might uh, tr trip that alarm. We might be doing something and hey, we just, we just trip that alarm, it happens. And we think, oh gosh, this is awful, I'm not making any progress. But I like to show them this because re recovery is never completely linear. It looks just like that. But I usually tell my patients, you take two steps forward, guess what? You take one step back, you're still making progress, all right? So keep that in mind if anyone is actually going through this currently. Um, and pass over to Jake. All right, so sleep, often overlooked and underappreciated because you're literally doing nothing, all right? But sleep is very, very important, all right? Sleep helps regulate your hormones like cortisol, which can also help manage your body's stress response. We all know when we haven't had a lot of sleep, we feel more stress and on edge. We've already talked about how stress can affect our pain, all right? Sleep directly decreases pain, by decreasing the sensitivity of your alarm system, because sleep is an important part of your health. You're getting this taken care of. Your body is less in a distress mode, so your alarm system can start to relax, all right? There's a lot of tips that you can do to help with your pain, 
Um, if you guys have any questions about pain, on July 16th, Dr. Triplehorn's gonna be here talking about uh, sleep uh, benefits and things like that. It's a nice little promo there. Um, but some quick and easy tips that you can do, pretty common sense, avoid caffeine at the end of the day, make sure that you're exposed to a lot of light throughout the day so your body can regulate what's daytime and what's nighttime. I know we live in a unique environment where it's light where it's not supposed to be and it's dark when you don't want it to be, but best you can, try to get exposed to some natural light. Exercise, I don't know if you guys have heard this before, pretty important, exercise can help you sleep. If you're jacked up at the end of the day, you can get some of that energy out throughout the day through exercise and actually get some rest. And finally, one of the things really important and often overlooked is trying to wake up at the same time every day. We all adults, we all have busy lives. You can't always go to bed at the same time. Things come up. But what you can control is when you set your alarm to wake up. You can start that rhythm going. You can start that routine. So that's a thing that can help with some of your um, sleep issues. Oftentimes what I see happen to people is that they're in too much pain so they don't sleep. And they don't sleep because they're in too much pain. And it's a vicious cycle. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah, see some nods there. I'm not gonna say his name because it has a swear word in it. But the people laughing know who this guy is, all right? He's unhappy because he eats. He eats because he's unhappy. It's a vicious cycle, but that cycle is only gonna get broken once you take care of it. So now finally, setting goals. This is where we put the rubber to the road, okay? This is where we put the plan into action. If you ask yourself, and if I didn't have any more pain today, what could I do? And think about that, and that's a goal. You can start to reverse engineer back to that, all right? When you're setting goals, you need to remember to set realistic, functional goals, something that you can measure. When you say, I just want to get better, okay, measure me better. You can't. You're going to be a dog chasing its tail. If you say, I want to walk around the block one time, I can measure that. I only made it halfway around the block before I needed to get picked up. And now I need to know how much farther I need to go the next time, okay? You also need to set realistic goals because we talked about this negative feedback loop with goal setting, okay? Oftentimes I see people in May think that they're going to lose their 25 pounds to get their beach body by June. And when they fail, they get down on themselves. They think, oh. I just failed again, I can't believe that I did this, and it's a vicious cycle. Make it easy for you. Set yourself up for success. Set a, set a very, very easy goal because you wanna break that vicious cycle. You wanna start a positive feedback loop where, hey, I just did a goal, and I can feel good about myself. And when you feel good about yourself, you can reward yourself because you should feel good about creating even the smallest goal because you're starting to make that progress in the right direction. All right? You have to remember though, when you reward yourself, you need to be reasonable. You can't walk up one flight of stairs and then eat a sheet cake as a reward, okay? A lot of people do this. And if you do this, you're gonna end up like that guy's name that I can't say, all right? We don't want that. We wanna make progress in the right direction and you wanna be kind to yourself. So just like Rachel was saying, you don't need to exercise for 30 minutes if you haven't exercised at all. Start with three minutes. That's okay. Try it out. See how it feels. If it goes all right, go to four, and then to five. But make sure it's something that you can measure, all right? As you keep doing this, your, your body's gonna realize, my alarm system doesn't need to be so high once I start this new activity. However, if you go from zero minutes to 30 minutes, your alarm system is gonna go, we're getting broken into, again, someone get the barricade out because someone's gonna invade our house. So start low and go slow. Tell people, tell people what your goals are. When you tell someone what your goal is, you've just materialized this goal. I don't know how many times I've thought of a goal that I wanted to do, and I tell one person, I'm, I'm thinking about running this marathon. Boom, I'm accountable now, because I just made it into reality. And someone else can hold me accountable to reaching these goals. When you tell someone, tell someone that's gonna support you, not someone that's gonna pester you. Because the easiest way to get someone not to do something is to tell them to do it. And they're not going to do it, right? 
So get someone that's going to be supportive and not a drill instructor, all right? Write the goal down. We talked about materializing by telling people. When you write it down, that goal is tangible. You can hold it. It's becoming more and more real. You can post it as a reminder to move in the right direction. Like Rachel was saying, you're going to have days that aren't so good, that are going to feel like a, step, uh, a setback. But if you keep your eyes on the prize, keep moving forward, keep focused, you'll eventually get there if you're persistent. And then log your progress. We think that we have these great memories when we don't. I don't know how many times I'm working out and I think that I had six reps last time or seven. I'm pretty tired. I'm pretty sure it was five. Okay, five, done. And then I rest, okay? If I write it down, I know. I'm accountable to myself. And that's who you should be accountable to. You should be accountable to yourself when you're setting these goals because you're trying to treat yourself. You're trying to take care of yourself. This is a great way to do it. Now, a lot of people will start off on the right track and get going, but then we always run into lacking motivation, okay? Everyone has a great start, but once you get halfway through the race, then they have a big, they have a big problem, all right? You need to appreciate that motivation is a finite resource. It will run out, okay? There are some people out there, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who gets up at 4 a.m. every day and exercises for an hour before he films his fifth movie. Great, that's good for him. He's the exception to the rule. For the rest of us humans, motivation runs out, all right? What can keep you honest is setting a routine. If you set a routine, you're more likely to come back to doing that activity. When I woke up this morning, I was not motivated to brush my teeth. And the only time I'm motivated to brush my teeth is about the week before and the week after I see my dentist, <laughs> all right? I'm not waking up and thinking to myself, I'm about to get after this gingivitis and this tartar better watch out because the floss is coming out here today. No, that's not what happened. I woke up and I was tired and I wanted to drink coffee, but I didn't because I walked by the bathroom and I brushed my teeth because I've been brushing my teeth for decades. Right? It, be, it just became automatic. I don't even think about it. I'm never motivated to brush my teeth. When you're starting a new routine, if you just set a time that you're going to do it and punch the clock, you're going to have bad days where you don't want to do it. But you do it often enough, it's going to be just like brushing your teeth. It's, be, it's going to become automatic. So, to wrap this all up, as a summary, Pain is an output that's produced by the brain when it feels threatened. Acute pain and chronic pain are two different disease processes, and therefore they need to be treated differently. Chronic pain causes changes throughout your nervous system, and that can behave like a disease in, in its own right. Pain is not the same thing as tissue damage. You can experience pain without tissue damage, and you can have tissue damage without any pain. We need to start looking at taking a biopsychosocial approach to treat the whole person. Not all body, not all brain, but the whole person and everything that's involved in their pain experience. And finally, to try to take conservative approaches, focusing primarily on education, aerobic activity, sleep, and goal setting. That'll set you in the right, in the right direction. If you guys like uh, what you just heard today, you can watch this video. We're gonna show it, but we don't have time. This guy says what we said in about five minutes, and he probably says it better. But then we can't give this to you if you just show you a five minute video. You're not going to show up, are you? I'm just kidding. I think we did an okay job. Rachel? Yeah. But finally, real quick, real quick, if you know of anyone that would benefit from a conversation like this, on the first Thursday of every month, starting at six at the hospital, we have a chronic pain program that we deliver to the general public. Anyone's welcome to come. There's free food. Uh, we're not going to be doing it in July because that's July 4th. And I'm a free American. I'm going to celebrate that. Um, but uh, if anyone wants to come, you sure can. So this Thursday. This Thursday, two days from now. If you want it all over again. It's a different presentation, but. So. Oh, yeah. There's a bag in the back, or a table in the back with a whole bunch of swag. Feel free to take it. There's some hard candy, uh, a bunch of pamphlets. Take them. If you know someone that would benefit from them, pass it out. That's what they're there for. Six at the in the McGowan room at the Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. First floor. First floor, and it's there's pamphlets in the back. Feel free to take, but it's the first Thursday, six to seven. When you come in, there's signs are direct, but it is on the first floor. So 
Um, yeah, feel free if you want to learn a little bit more. It is a different pre presentation than tonight, so you might learn something new. Or if you know of anyone else, family members, friends who could benefit, like Jake said, come this Thursday is our next talk. But and then we'll skip in July, but back to it in August. So thank you for coming. If there's any questions, we're happy to take any questions. Oh, sure. I hear you. Oh, that this. So and the was it the. This one here? Oh, Tame the Beast. Oh, Tame the Beast. So if you just tamethebeast.org, <coughs> I will get it to you. You will find it. Tamethebeast.org. There is, pay, uh, I printed it hopefully enough, but I printed out that. There's actually a list. Yeah, there's a list in the back. It actually gives a multiple other, like, kind of really cool YouTube videos that I often give to a lot of my patients, and Jake does too, to kind of help um, explain things a little differently. And that is on that piece of paper. So take that um, on your way out. That's a great question, and unfortunately, that type of question would be outside of my scope. What I would need to do is say, you should probably speak with your doctor about getting set up with the, with the sleep specialist, or you can come July 16th and ask Dr. Triplehorn that question. Um, I've actually never been asked that before. Well, what I would say, um, we can get not we can't get too much of a good thing as well. So sleep is great, but lots and lots of sleep necessarily isn't better. Um, and there is a condition called chronic fatigue syndrome, which is very well documented. It's very linked to chronic pain. Um, and these people are very fatigued, actually sleep very well, and they but they still wake up very very um, tired and low energy. And so getting too much sleep or getting it, it can actually be a problem yeah. that you'd potentially want to, you'd want to speak to a sleep specialist. Yeah, yeah. potentially yeah. might be. Um, amplifying some of the things, but absolutely, we're not sleep specialists. Okay, so if you have that that problem, those questions, definitely address it with your with your physician. It could be Hashimoto's too. Exactly. There's lots of lots of different ex yeah, lots of different ex rooms. Um, in the red. Um, have you worked with fibromyalgia? Absolutely. Abs absolutely. Coupled with other modalities. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're physical therapists. I just want to say that like we, these four pr primary f uh, pillars are very, very important across ev ev everything. And but there's still so many other conservative things you can do. We, we're physical therapists, so of course, yeah, physical therapy works. There's lots of other modalities and other uh, health professions that can help. But for, you cannot only do your methods to no, help absolutely not. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It can definitely. So we're not saying that you have to that only do this. Absolutely. And everyone is very different. We talked about everyone experienced pain different. So everyone's input is very different. Everyone's pie is different. So yeah. what we don't want to. We don't want to say that it's a method per yeah. per, per se. It's yeah. It, every, every, it's. No, it's a, it, think it's a, t a team approach, a multidisciplinary approach for sure. Absolutely, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, you, sorry, you had a question. Yeah, um, from a physiological and maybe a rehabilitation standpoint, um, pairing that in in conjunction with the best sleep to get, when's the best time to do exercise throughout the day? The best time to do exercise. Is when you're going to do the exercise, yes. and and that's and I and I know that's the quintessential non-answer answer, but it's the truth. If somebody told you that 4 a.m. is the best time to do exercise, but you can't wake up to do it, then it's not benefiting you because you're not exercising. What happens a lot of the time with exercise is people get paralysis through analysis, which means they focus on the five percent. When's a perfect time to exercise, or eat, or supplement to take, or or whatnot but they forget the 95%, which is exercise is very, very good. So there's no right or wrong time, really, so long as you can do it. But that being said, you, there's a lot of people out there who can maybe tell you what the right or wrong time is based on their quote unquote expertise. But again, if you, you're your own person, and if you can't do it at that time, that's okay. The important thing to do is just make sure that you move and you exercise. 
I think just on top of that, I think you got to keep perspective too of the person. So if you are an elite athlete, there are a lot of like um, biomechanical and uh, you could get really into the physiology that, yeah, maybe certain times of the day might be better for that elite athlete to improve the, the does that make sense? But with chronic pain, the goal is to decrease that sensitization of the system. And whenever you can do that in terms of that you can fit it into your, into your day is best. But we do know with energy levels do cycle with people with chronic pain to an extent and so when you do generally we have a little bit more our cortisol levels there's actually kind of rises and falls that naturally should happen and with people with chronic pain a lot of times those cortisol levels can get off so in terms of when you feel more energized it very, might be different than what other people so maybe when naturally when you feel a little more energized in a day it might be a good time to do it but from a physiological or neuroanatomy perspective it's really about doing it too, and being consistent to decrease that sensitization and decrease that input and output <laughs> process. As far as like, you know, uh, cortisone or cortisol mm -hmm. levels um, pumped up just from doing a big exercise right before you go to sleep or something like that, does that help? Or I, yeah. There's so, so many people are different. I, it's, really, it's, it's really hard to say to give you a concrete answer without not being completely forthright. There are there are marathon runners who live in Phoenix, Arizona, who get up at 3 a.m. to run because they can't run at noon. They just can't do it. It's too hot. And they manage. They do great. They're high-level athletes. So, you know, I try, I try not to get lost in the minutia. It is important, but if you take care of that 95% component first, you'll get so many results that you won't even care about the, the remaining 5%. So, but good question. Anyone else? We can talk about it. sure, yeah, we'll, we'll pump it up here, uh, pump up our profession. We, we wanted just, this just to be a general education about pain and not kind of a, a commercial for physical therapy. But you're right, physical therapy can help people with chronic pain quite a lot. Um, say for example, a lot of times people have an issue with standing up from a chair. It hurts when I stand up from a chair. Well, a physical therapist is a movement specialist, so we can break that movement down into smaller components. And when we break that down, we, we, can, we can make it more manageable for you. So we can elevate the chair up much higher so your range of motion is decreased. Um, we can grade the exercises up or down based on your current ability to perform that activity. Um, and then as we go, we, we can start to progress that exercise and build you up and get you stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, there's a, Really funny saying that strength is never a weakness, and nobody has ever said that, they've, that they're too strong, right? So when you go to physical therapy, you get a lot of this education. We see what your impairments are, and then what we do is we break whatever motions, whatever impairments, what am I trying to say here, Rachel? Whatever impairments. They're individualized to that person. Yeah, it's individualized yeah. to the person. So like I say, getting out of a chair, getting out of bed and whatnot, we can break those movements down into more manageable parts, and then we can train you in those broken down movements to try to strengthen you more and more, I can add if on. that makes any sense. And I can add on, I think, what maybe you're um, trying to ask or kind of, so with, to give you a little example of the, my patients I see daily, so when I have a chronic pain patient, I am going to treat them a little bit different than someone who has an acute back pain. So ha what that typical treatment looks like to treat chronic pain on a clinical day-to-day -day basis, um, I usually tell my patients, so um, about probably about 50% initially is going to be an educational component, okay? That doesn't mean we're going to necessarily sit down and just read and, and we're going to be, hey, maybe as we gently go for a walk, I'm going to be talking to you and educating you. Sometimes I, we actually have a lot of like um, little pamphlets, bo little booklets, educational material. So it's super important that in order to help manage your chronic pain, you need to understand it. So the chronic pain program or, or when you see a therapist for chronic pain management, a lot of education, okay, so I'd say 50%, but then on top of it, it's really about setting functional goals. So physical therapists are going to do a very um, thorough physical, physical and neurological assessment to see what your baseline is, to see how sensitive is your nervous system. There's, we have tricks and tips and little things we can do to kind of fi get figure out, hey, how, how, how nervous 
how sensitive is your nerves, right? And we set really realistic goals. And really, to be honest, a lot of it is almost like a coach and to kind of help guide you. So to help guide you, well, how do I, when do I know to push and when do I know when to stop? And okay, I've had these symptoms when I did this. Is that safe? Is that not safe? So a lot of education of knowing of what I do as a physical therapist on a daily basis is guiding through that. Um, and absolutely, we're, we, we can, there's a lot of different modalities that we can use, um, but we focus on the active ones, right? Um, my, the goal of physical therapy, especially with chronic pain um, program or chronic pain um, patients, is I like to use an analogy, we've used an analogy before, of, um, of a car. I don't know how to oil, I don't know how to change my oil. So I have to go in sometimes to get my oil changed. I could go get my oil changed, every, let's say every month or every three months or how, see, I don't even know how often I need to do it. Um, um, or I can also teach myself or have someone teach me and I can do it myself. And so with, with our goal as physical therapists, truly I joke, that our goal is to put ourselves out of business. So we want to empower you and teach you the tools of, you know, how can you help yourself and manage your own pain and treat your own pain on a long-term basis. We don't want to be, want you become reliant on us necessarily. There might be a, a time period, yeah, where we need to teach you, but then it's about, okay, teaching you and and letting you free, letting you go, and so that you can apply. Other things we do, with speci specifically with chronic pain, do a lot of mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, st uh, stress management, coping techniques. There's a lot of things we can do within the physical therapist. I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sleep specialist or, a, um, or anything like that, but there's a lot of things even within our profession that from a physical aspect that we can actually um, address those issues as well. Does that, does that kind of answer a little bit more? Yeah. How about acupuncture? Acupuncture is great. Go, go try. Absolutely, if you've ever tried it, it's a very well documented form of conservative therapy that can help decrease that nervous system. Absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't work for everyone. Again, some people like it, some people don't. Um, my my kind of um, theory on that is try it. Guess what? That is going to be better for you than so let's say the alter uh, the alternate, which is maybe taking a, a pain pill. So, you know, less risk, absolutely, absolutely try it. Yeah? What if you got no cartilage left, or what are, you know, what mm -hmm. bone on bone? Should you try physical therapy? Or? Yes, yeah. you should. Say, let's say, worst case scenario, that you do need to get a surgery. Let's say that that's set in stone and it's going to happen. That's fine if that's how your issue needs to be addressed. But you'd be better served entering that, sur that surgery stronger than weaker because once you get the surgery, once the surgery is complete, your outcome is going to be much better because you've already had that strength foundation built up. So now once you start trying to walk again and get out of bed and move and things like that, you have this strength to help you through your recovery. So that's worst case scenario. You need a surgery. You get physical therapy, you get stronger, and you have a more successful surgery because you're stronger. Best case scenario is you start physical therapy, your pain decreases, and you don't need a surgery. What if the surgeon says you're too old? There's a, there's a lot of different reasons for why a surgeon might say that someone's too old for having a surgery. It could go into a lot of different comorbidities. Um, going under anesthesia is no joke. It's very, very serious. And your surgeon wants to make sure that you wake up after you go out. That's, in order to have a successful surgery, that needs to happen first. So in order to address that question, I feel like you need to talk to your surgeon as to why that person might feel that a person might be too old. I mean, you were raising your head over here. So I have two questions. One is, what is the difference between is it karma? Yeah. So you bring up a good point. So the antithesis to the placebo is the nocebo effect. Okay? Nocebo effect. Placebo, nocebo effect. And a lot of times when people hear the word placebo, they think fake. That's not the case. The placebo is very real. If you take a sugar pill and it makes you feel better, that pill worked, even though that there's no medication in that pill. So to address your question, the nocebo effect. There's been a couple studies done on this, and they're very interesting. 
Uh, one of the studies that was done is they took people who reported that they were sensitive to Wi-Fi uh, waves, okay? They brought them into a room and they put a, a, a modem or a router, I'm not an IT guy, on the table, okay? There, were no, there was no Wi-Fi signal being produced. They just turned on the little green light on the device. People in the audience experienced symptoms, okay? The symptoms were real, but no Wi-Fi signals were being produced. There was another study done where they took two groups of people, gluten sensitive and gluten tolerant people, and they said, we're gonna put you into two different groups. We're gonna randomize and we're gonna blind you into two different groups, okay? Um, and you're not gonna know what you're gonna get. Some people experienced symptoms uh, consistent with gluten intolerance, and some people didn't. The caveat to the study was, nobody received gluten. People just thought, since they were randomized and blinded, that they were going to receive gluten. And as a result, they had a negative consequence to it. So the mind is extremely powerful. We often underplay how powerful the mind is. We think we're so smart. We're not that smart. For the longest time, we thought, oh yeah, the sun, it goes around like that, and the Earth's right here. So the Earth's the center, and the sun goes like that. Yeah, duh, that's the way it goes. What, you said that the Earth goes around the sun? Send that guy to jail. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, if I look across the ocean, it, it's flat. Obviously, the Earth is flat. And if I keep sailing the way, I'm going to fall off the edge of the Earth. Because look, we just think we're so smart, and, and we're not. Our brain plays tricks on us all the time. It doesn't mean that it's fake, but it means that it's more powerful than we think it is. And, and I, yeah. That's awesome. Really mm -hmm. more than the, the mm -hmm. and I only had to pay her 20 bucks to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good 20 bucks if I ask me. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So you're talking about um, kind of like being afraid of pain mm -hmm. and maybe um, increase your pain. Mm -hmm. It, it, I'd like to say that a lot of times um, you don't have to have, and a lot of people I see with chronic pain, they don't always have an injury or a, 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 a kind of acute pain to kind of explain why, right? Or like you fell off your bike and hurt yourself and you know it just kind of came out of nowhere. That's, that happens quite often. I don't have a statistic of how often, but it very, very, is, very happens, happens very often. I don't have an exact answer for you. Again, what Jake and I, both of us alluded to, the brain is so powerful. And whenever it perceives a threat, it's going to it's going to turn on its most powerful protector and its most powerful motivator, and that's pain. So sometimes you have to think about okay, what else was going on in your life at that point when the when the pain started? For example, I had this patient um, a couple of years ago now, this elderly lady, um, and she it was October, and she came in and she's like, I have I've been having back pain for the last couple of months, and I'm like okay, and didn't assess, okay, what, anything start? No, I don't, I can't can't figure out anything, nothing. I'm like, have you had this pain before? She's like, yeah, I kind of started actually a year ago. And she's like, actually it happened about a year ago in, in October. So we do a full assessment and really couldn't find any, any crazy red flags of what's going on. You know, she's a little stiff, a little sore, a little, but nothing major. And then we kept talking, okay, well, what else is going on? And then through the, through the evaluation, she, real, she kind of um, opened up and said, oh, well, in October, this past October was the anniversary of my husband's death. Um, and she's been struggling a lot with depression in that month. Um, and when she kind of looked back and realized, oh wow, my, her pain pattern was very linked to this emotional time in her life. Um, and for her, that was kind of a, 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 something she determined that was an input of, that was causing her pain to 
to feel threatened. So it's not always easy, and so there's not always an answer. If there's not always, why do I have this pain? Um, we don't have answers. We don't always know, but we know that it's the brain. It's absolutely the brain for some reason to perceive in a threat. So it's, it's maybe, but maybe not bio, maybe psycho, maybe social. Um, I do encourage if you do have onset of pain, even without an injury. I mean, we can't emphasize the importance of going and getting an evaluation, seeking out medical help, okay? Um, because a very small percentage of, it could be something bad, and I'm not trying to scare you, but you also have to make sure what, what we are, what we are not saying is, if you have pain, didn't come from anything, oh, that means it's, it means it's all psychosocial pain. That's not what we're saying. We gotta make sure you rule out those big red flags first. Um, that make sure there isn't a tissue issue, right? Um, does that kind of answer? I, I'm sorry I don't have a more distinct answer, but because it is so complex. It's very, very complex. We hope the takeaway isn't that, just like Rachel said, pain's all in your brain. It's that there's a lot of things that contribute, that can contribute to it. And what we want to do is educate you guys to know that there's different avenues that you can look towards. So if, the, if you're addressing your tissue and you're not getting any results, try looking at some of these other things that we brought up and hopefully you guys can get some relief. That is true. So it actually is depending on your insurance. So Alaska, we actually have a direct access state, which means that you technically you can go in and see a physical therapist, but it's the insurance. Medicare, most private insurances are the ones who say that they need a, a doctor's referral. Does that make sense? So in order for it to go through, absolutely. Yeah. So I was uh, at Equinox Physical Therapy. Mm -hmm. go to the pool and I'm mm -hmm. taking swim lessons from Patty Bowen there. Mm -hmm. She had me doing something and again she said, does that hurt? I said, yeah. Well then don't do it. <laughs> and I've always remembered that. Mm -hmm. that you know, that, that, like you said, no pain, no gain. Right. is such a Right. But exactly. It comes back to trying to be that happy middle. No pain, no gain. You don't want to push through pain. Okay, right. it's it's there, but you also don't want to be so afraid of it, right? That you yeah. don't continue yeah. extra. It's, yeah. it's about modifying, changing. A lot of times, very changing the intensity, changing the activity that you can t continue to move. That you don't trigger that alarm. Yeah. Is that, yeah. 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 So finding that halfway in between. And I yep. Swear by using the pool. Good. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, any other any other final final question? Maybe we'll take one more. I just want to be respectful of people's time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.